In this episode, I'm going to talk about things I see players do when they're in the middle of a losing game or if they're facing a worse position. Should be a very interesting discussion. That's coming up, so stick around. Okay, welcome to the chess angle. So as a tournament director, I observe a lot of interesting things. And one of the things I noticed is the behavior of some of the players or the things they do changes if they're in the middle of a game that they're losing or if they're facing a much worse position. And I've noticed some patterns and I I thought I'd share this. Um, At some point, I plan on, you know, taking all my observations as a TD and writing a book about it. I kind of keep a note of these things in my phone. And then when I get enough material, um, I'm going to write a book, you know, the old saying, I could write a book. Well, I literally could uh, with what I see. So let's start with some common behaviors. Now, I'm only mentioning things that I've seen more than once. Okay, so the first thing that I'll see players do when they're in the middle of a losing game or in a worse position is they will offer a draw or do so repeatedly. Okay. So offering a draw is of course allowed. You can offer a draw in a worse position, but that's just considered poor etiquette or bad form. It's technically not against the rules, but repeated draw offers. And I had talked about this uh, in a previous episode, repeated draw offers are not permitted. Okay, that's considered uh, annoying behavior. And by repeated, I mean like every move. You offer a draw, the opponent declines it, then you wait one move and offer it again. I'm not talking about if you wait maybe 10 or 12 moves and the position changes. But repeated draw offers are not allowed. And when your opponent does that, a pretty common you know interpretation of that is that uh, he or she feels she's losing the game. So if if you think you have a better position, but you're not sure, and your opponent offers a draw, you're probably better. But that's one thing I noticed that they do. They just offer a draw in hopes of kind of, you know, weaseling their way out of it. I mean, I've done that occasionally. I'm not giving this talk sitting on my high horse, but usually I'll offer a draw in a worse position only if my opponent is in time pressure and you know, I kind of get him thinking, all right, you might be better, but are you going to lose on time? So you're kind of putting the test to your opponent. Do you have faith that you can take advantage of your better position with the limited time you have, or do you think you're going to lose on time? So an interesting dynamic there. Now, the second thing I notice players doing in the middle of a worse game is that they slam the pieces. Okay. As if, uh, you know, that's going to somehow distract the opponent or maybe it's just a sign of anger, but they'll make a move and they'll like whip the pieces down, which of course is not allowed. Um, I mean, if someone does that to me, I'll kind of say something, but I've seen it happen. I guess they're hoping to sort of get in their opponent's head or they somehow think that by slamming the piece that it makes the move stronger if they moved it gently. You know, I don't know, but it's just a common thing that I see. And that brings us to number three, which is they will move very quickly. Okay, so they'll kind of whip out the moves really fast. So the winning player will make a move. And rather than think about their best defense, we'll talk about that coming up. Because there, there's a correct way to handle these worst positions. I'll, I'll share my thoughts on that at the end. But anyway, the winning player, uh, by winning I mean the player with the better position, will make a move. And rather than think about your best option, they just kind of whip out a response. Maybe it's in frustration. Maybe it's to try to get that player to move quickly as well. Cause that's sort of a human reflexive thing. Like your opponent plays fast. You need to feel that uh, maybe you have to play fast as well, but it's something I see. It's not a good idea. If you're in a losing position, uh, playing quickly is just going to make things even worse for you. So number four is when players are losing, they will start a mindless mating attack or a pawn storm. So basically, okay, you know, their thought process is I have a worse position. I'm just going to play for mate. Even if the position doesn't call for it, 
they'll just start throwing their pawns towards the opponent's king, even though it's making things worse. They'll just start a mating attack. Uh, it's basically, I, I call that like temper tantrum chess. You're upset, you're frustrated that you're not playing well. So you just go for mate rather than find a way to maybe improve things. Okay. It's basically like, you know, like a spoiled child stomping his foot. That's the chess version of it. You just start a meeting attack against the king. Well, why not? I'm losing anyway. I mean, in certain situations, if you're both in time pressure, maybe you can get away with that. But if it's not a clock issue, that's not going to really do anything for you. Which brings us to number five. And this is sort of a new phenomenon at my club. I don't know. This is like the new thing where the player in the worst position or who's losing the game will accuse the other player of not keeping score. So let's talk about that one. Yes, it is a rule, a USCF, uh, that's the United States Chess Federation rule, that you have to keep score during the game, unless it's like a blitz rated or something like that. But in a regular rated uh, tournament, meaning you know with a normal longer time control, you have to keep score. And the only exception to that is if either player has less than five minutes left, then both players can stop keeping score. And the way to handle it, if you see your opponent's not keeping score, you're supposed to say something to the tournament director right away. You pause the clock, you call over the TD, and you say, you know, my opponent's not keeping score. And, you know, what the TD will do, what I would do in that situation, you basically just warn the player, just say, look, you need to keep score. If it happens again, you would probably add two minutes to the opponent's clock. And if, I mean, if it continues, then you have to look into other uh, penalties. But I mean, generally after the initial warning, that's usually enough. But what a lot of players are doing is they're waiting until after the game, which of course, you know, at that point, there's nothing I can do, or they'll wait till the end of the game when they have a completely losing position. And then all of a sudden, well, he's not keeping score. You know, I even had one guy accuse uh, his opponent who wasn't keeping score of, you know, even cheating. Okay. But I don't know, this is like the new thing that they're pulling, uh, you know, the rabbit they're pulling out of the hat, so to speak, or the club they're pulling out of the bag, accusing the other guy of not keeping score. I mean, even if it's true, it's not going to get them out of a losing position because if it's the first time they're bringing it to my attention, all I can really do is warn that player and have him catch up on uh, correcting his score sheet uh, during his time. But people think that somehow, you know, it should change the result of the game. And, you know, it doesn't work that way. So number six, okay, we have two more of these. Number six is excessive sighing, right? This is like, uh, you know, the big bad wolf uh, type of person, right? Like the big bad wolf from uh, Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, oh. So what they'll do is every time they move, you know, the player in the worst position, they'll just be like, oh, oh, like this exasperated sigh every time. And, you know, it can get really annoying to listen to. Uh, you know, we all get frustrated. You know, it's a rated game. It's a tournament and you're in a worse position. You know, it's tough on the ego. It, it's frustrating. We, we've all been there. I've probably expressed my, you know, frustration at a lost position um, at times more than I should have. But you know, there are players uh, lately uh, that I've seen where they just do this like sighing thing every time they move. And it's, you know, it's distracting, you know, you really can't do it, but that's something I'm seeing. And then number seven, which is very frustrating for me as a tournament director is the post game email to me. Uh, or I'll get like a, you know, a text message or something after the game has ended. So I'll get a call like the next day and, oh yeah, by the way, I don't think the clock was set correctly or, you know, he kept getting up out of his seat or he kept uh, checking his phone or, you know, he, um, you know, his rating is too low for the way he was playing, you know, things like this. They'll talk to me after the game of the next day as if I can do something. And, you know, that that's really frustrating for me because it's like, okay, you lost, just, you know, that's how it is. You're not going to win every game. But I'm just amazed at how often I'll receive uh, messages like that. It's like they're trying to change the result or something. And, 
you, you know, you just can't do it. Once the game ends, you know, once you actually have a result and the score sheet is marked, the tournament director really can't do anything at that point. Okay. I mean, unless there was, you know, some type of, you know, really overwhelming evidence uh, that, you know, something was wrong. So let's move on and talk about what you should do in a worse position. Okay. So the first thing is you don't just want to throw in the towel and roll over and play dead. Okay. You want to put up a fight and you want to resist as much as possible. Put up a fight on, on the chessboard. That is, of course, I mean that figuratively, you know, find very annoying moves. That's what you want. You want moves where you want to play moves where it really forces your opponent to think where he or she can maybe go wrong. You want to trip them up, so to speak. Okay. And in addition, look for something positive in your position that you can exploit. Maybe you have a certain piece that's better, or maybe you have control of a file. See if you can create weaknesses. See if you can take advantage of the positives that you do have. And if you're in a worse position, and especially if the, if, you know, if the queens are on the board and your heavy pieces are on the board, you have a chance of mixing things up even more. And try to exploit your opponent's weaknesses. Maybe he has a pawn you can attack or a, you know, a file that you can control or maybe his king is a little bit loose. There's got to be something. Try to you know, restrain his positives and increase yours. Let me give you an example. This is true not making this up for the podcast. I was playing a higher rated player a few weeks ago. I dropped an exchange in the middle game. Okay. And I'm not going to say, you know, that it was a game losing move. You know, the exchange, contrary to popular belief, the exchange is not as serious a problem as some people make it out to be. Okay. Unless his extra rook is really active and causing problems compared to your minor piece. You know, the exchange is not the end of the world. And in many end games, it can be very tough to win when up in exchange if your rook isn't that active. But that's a whole separate end game discussion. The point is, I was down in exchange, but the queens and other pieces were on the board. But I saw the positives that I had. And I said, okay, don't get frustrated. My pieces were active. And he had some weak squares. And what I ended up doing was, I kept my composure and I arranged it so, you know, my bishop was actually better than his rook. I aligned my bishop and queen on a diagonal that uh, were both attacking uh, as a battery, a pawn in front of his king, whereas his rook wasn't active and had no file. So as compensation, um, I had a very active minor piece against his rook and he had a very weak pawn that I was attacking. And his rook had no open files, okay? I mean, it's fascinating and it's all well and good if you're up in exchange, but if that extra rook is not active, it doesn't mean much. So basically, I made my minor piece better than his rook. And as it turns out, I did lose the game, but I actually missed a draw opportunity uh, in the end game. And so the point is, I actually played very well and you know, shame on me for missing this draw. But the point is, I didn't you know, do any of these other things I mentioned. I didn't just start getting frustrated and slamming the pieces and moving quickly and, and starting a mindless, uh, mating attack when the position didn't call for that. I simply looked at my positives, looked at his position, because again, you have to be aware of your opponent's plans as well. You know, this is what you should be thinking about. And I made my minor piece better than his rook. Now, it's not always easy to do that. And a lot of times it's not going to work out that way. But I found a plan, you know, and I found something that worked. And I put up a resistance. And as I said, I should have drawn the game. I missed this move later on, that's going to happen. But I handled it properly. And you know what, if this happens again, next time, I'll probably get the draw. And there are times you might even win, depending on what your opponent does. So I just wanted to share these uh, thoughts about these um, behaviors, quote unquote, that I've seen when players are in worse positions. And just remember, if you're in a losing position, just find a way. Look at a way to put up a fight, stop your opponent's play, find annoying moves that force your opponent to think. You can even look for what they call, you know, swindles. As long as it doesn't worsen your position, a swindle is sort of a 
little bit of a risky move, uh, sort of a trick move. And if your opponent falls for it, he gets a worse position. That's more of a last resort, but you should keep it in mind. But before you get to that point, you know, do some of the other things I said, you know, put up a fight, find annoying moves, look for something positive that you can exploit. You know, there's got to be something in the position you can work with. And at the amateur level, there's a very good chance your opponent is going to blunder. And let's face it, probably 90 to 95% of amateur games are decided because somebody blunders at some point. It's the old expression, right? Whoever wins at the amateur level is the person who makes the next to last mistake. So some interesting things to think about. As always, I appreciate you listening and I hope you win your next game. Have a great day. We'll